Hello everyone. In this episode, we're going to look at the O-ring theory of economic development. This is a framework that was put together by Michael Kramer, who was one of the three Nobel laureates in economics in 2019. And the idea here is that we're going to model production with strong complementarities among inputs. Usually, one thinks about this in terms of the input's quality, such as the skill level of workers. However, there are also implications here for the way firms interact in an economy. So the idea for the, the name, the O-ring model, comes from the Challenger space shuttle disaster in the 1980s, in which one small part, I think it was at a cost of around $5, one small part caused the destruction of the entire space shuttle, the explosion, loss of life of seven people along with a billion dollar or something uh, spacecraft. And so the notion here is that the, the parts of the spaceship have to work together so perfectly that if even there's a failure among one small part, the result can be complete disaster. And so this is something like the notion of strong complementarities in production. If something goes wrong, then a lot of value that's been added can be lost. So then one result of this is that there's going to be some positive assortive matching in production. For example, in firms, you'll see high skill individuals grouped together in some firms and low skill individuals grouped together in other firms. Rather than develop a full model, I think the main ideas can be gotten across in a simple way, thinking about an overall planner for the economy. The planner is trying to think about efficiency for the economy. But the metaphor we're going to use here is that you have a human resource department with four workers, and they have to be grouped together in two departments. And so the question is, um, if we have workers of different skills, do we mix them or do we match them? So for simplicity, we could think of, we have two high skilled workers, we call them H workers in this notation, two low skilled workers, we call them OL workers. And so the idea is for maximum efficiency or the most product that we can get out of their work, do we wanna mix and match? Do we wanna have the two H skill workers together and the two L school skill workers together over here, or do you want an H and an L and an L and an H? And it turns out that with strong complementarities, you want to group them with the, with the high together and the low together. The particular form of the production function here is the product of the quality of the inputs. And this, can, this will be generalized in different ways, but this gets a, at the core idea. So you're multiplying the, the quality of for the high skill input times another quality of high skill input or a high skill input times a low input and so on. So do we mix or do we match? Do we have H times L, L times H, that's how we do it, or do we have an H times H and an L times L? Mix or match? Well, the answer is very simple. There's going to be a sort of matching. The H's and L's will be separated here. And how do we know that? Very simply with this setup, because H squared plus L squared will always be greater than two times H times L. And that just follows from this um, result that you see in Introduction to Algebra. And you can also try it with any numbers that you like. Um, this holds as long as, of course, H and L are not the same number then we don't have um, anything of interest um, to learn from this at all. So this just illustrates that with strong complementarities, it's more efficient to match, produce with positive assortive matching. And among other things, this has some implications for what the international economy is going to look like in terms of specialization. And so here's some details. This concept of Q, the quality of input, is very flexible. These interpretations can be a quality index of characteristics. So 0.95, 0.95, 0.95, 0.95, 0.95, 0.95, 0.95, 0.95, 0.95, 0.95, 0.95, 0.95, 0.95, 0.95, 0.95, 0.95, 0.95, 0.95,
That could mean there's 95% chance that the task is completed perfectly, so you have 95% of the maximum total value, but 5% of the time, or 5% of the cases, there will be no value at all. Or it could always be completed to have 95% of its value. Or there could be a 50% chance of having 100% value and a 50% chance of a 90% value, giving an expectation as a result of a 95% value once again. So that the higher the skill, the higher the probability that some task will be successfully completed. So there, the part created won't fail, but in a way that's just an analogy for broader ideas of success. And so bottleneck effects can occur where you get stuck. So suppose that you need n tasks to produce a good, right? So that instead of two parts that we're multiplying together, we've got n. And so think about some st standard level for these n tasks. And it could be a Q of 0.95 like we just saw. But now suppose among the workers you have, suppose that when you take a look, you find the actual skill levels of two workers are cut in half. So this could also be um, the um, result that 75% of the output will be lost because cutting, you're multiplying all these together, cutting one of the numbers in half uh, makes the uh, result fall by half already, and then cutting another in half means there's a fall of 75% of the value. And so that um, if there were less skill investments by workers, then that reduces the skill levels in the economy. That lowers the incentive for others to, work, to uh, invest in skill. Remember, the idea is that with strong complementarity, the value of what you do depends on what the value of others do. And so here's some implications. Well, first of all, I've already said firms tend to employ workers of similar skill for tasks. Workers performing the same task at a high skill firm will earn higher wages than in a low skill firm because their productivity, again, depends upon those around them. And that will mean that they're having more productivity just because of the fact they're working with higher skilled workers. The model also explains why a worker of a given skill moving from a low income country to a high income country gets this higher wage even though they're doing the same thing, they're employing the same skills they were before. Um, and, and, and indeed, wages in this model are increasing with this skill level Q at an increasing rate so that wages are more than proportionately higher in developed countries. And also when co-workers or others doing complementary work have higher skills, there's greater incentives for others to acquire more skills, again, because they get productivity benefits that are stronger for doing so. And so this is an income externality, and we've seen an income externality before when we looked at the big push. And this is the condition in which multiple equilibria can emerge, and in fact, Michael Kramer, in his original article about this approach of the O-ring theory, did in fact show the S-shaped um, relationship that we already talked about as being a hallmark of typical situations of multiple equilibria um, potentially emerging. There can also be O-ring effects across firms. I'm going to try to spell that out, um, idea out a little more here. So economy-wide, low-level quality of production traps can occur. You, and this can be the case when firms are interacting and there's O-ring effects in the interaction among firms as well as what happens within firms. And this kind of externality can create a case for industrial policy or industrialization strategy to encourage quality upgrading. And we saw that in something in, uh, like this in a number of East Asian countries, such as uh, Korea, touched on a little bit in the case study at the end of chapter three, and much more in the case study at the end of chapter 12, um, and in China, which is um, you know, looked at it in the case study on, on that country, on China at the end of chapter four. But um, this kind of uh, situation um, magnifies 
local production um, bottlenecks because they have a multiplicative effect on other firms. So if there's a bottleneck in one firm, one activity, it's going to spill out into others. Now such bottlenecks could be ameliorated with some alternative source of inputs. One of those is through international trade, international investment. And so thinking about it in this way, the O-ring theory also helps us explain why economies that are cut off from the international um, e um, economy um, generally performed less well than those that were more integrated. <clears throat> we already looked at that to a degree when we examined our general classic theories of economic development in chapter three. Rich countries have larger firms and specialize in more complex um, products. And with the larger firms, you're multiplying together a lot more activities. And so the problem of losing lots of value because of, because of um, the quality of input goes wrong in, in a couple of the firms, you know, becomes very much um, larger. And it also shows the positive correlation of firm size and wages within and across uh, countries. Because there are many stages in which one has to invest value before you realize whether a couple of the stages or a couple of the inputs will have low uh, quality and may cost us a lot of value in the process. And so with that, I will end this episode on the O-ring effects and look forward to discussions about it.